welcome to the introduction of salmon and their life cycle. This is the first webinar in a series of three for the Kitsap Salmon webinar series. Our first speaker will be Jeff Adams, marine ecologist from Washington Sea Grants. All right, Jeff, the floor is yours. My name is Jeff Adams and I'm uh, a marine ecologist with Washington Sea Grant, which is a department at the University of Washington. And uh, we do a lot of outreach and a lot of communications work. Um, we uh, provide funding to uh, important and relevant research to marine communities. And, uh, and we also support a lot of students who um, take this knowledge and take it out to communities and take it into their own careers and pursue careers in, in fisheries and um, shoreline management and all sorts of directions. Um, so uh, my contact info is here. This is my mobile, mobile number. If you see something really cool, I, I enjoy seeing uh, texts of texts of pictures, the, the neat things that people see allows me to live a little vicariously through um, the experiences of others. And, um, but also feel free to shoot me an email at jaws at uw.edu. I always love to, to hear from folks and try to get back. Um, it sometimes gets a little, little overwhelming in emails these days. Um, so my, my blog and my social media is way out of date, but uh, there may be some little treat tidbits in there that are of interest too, if you want to explore. So let me get on with the um, presentation here and just want to start out with the salmon life cycle. Um, this may be something some of you are familiar with and um, uh, for others, maybe it's a, a way to kind of look at, um, uh, kind of understand the complexity of, of these, you know, kind of amazing creatures and the evolution they've gone through to get there. Um, you know, one of the really remarkable things about salmon is their, their anadromous life cycle. And, you know, anadromy means that they're born in fresh water and they migrate out into salt water and then return. And there's a cool analog of that called catadromy, which is where um, things are born in the salt water and return to the fresh water uh, and have their life cycle that way. And part of the reason for doing that is because one, the resources are limited in the stream, um, much more limited, and you can't have tens of thousands of, um, of you know, 10 pound salmon milling around in a stream all, all their you know, entire life and growing big and strong and um, still have enough resources to support them. So by having part of their life cycle where they go out to sea and feed off of forage fish and other fish and that, um, you know, forage fish are kind of a little fish like herring and anchovy that you might be familiar with. Um, and that allows them to grow really big and come back uh, large and full of eggs and ready to produce another generation in the streams. Um, and the fun part at the end of this class, we'll get uh, to look at a couple of these very large chum salmon and uh, dissect them and see, uh, see what some of these parts are. and um, and how, um, how they work, and especially this time of year when they're ready to reproduce. Um, so, you know, in, at the top of this diagram, you can kind of see the start of the eggs and the gravel where, you know, um, chum salmon may lay three or 4,000 eggs in a, in a red, R-E-D-D, -D, which is the, the place where they put, um, dig out a hole and place their eggs in the gravel and um, hope that the next fish won't come along and dig them up. Um, and some will, will, sometimes adults will hang around and as long as they can, they'll uh, guard their eggs and uh, protect them. But eventually as the uh, moldy fish at my first slide show there, and um, they just uh, run out of energy. And uh, if there's more fish to come, then they might uh, turn that up and use that same good habitat. But, um, so the female will, will put the eggs in there, the male will fertilize them. And uh, sometimes there's these little tiny males called jacks that come back early and have a different strategy of um, trying to sneak in when the female lays the eggs. And while the big males are all ripping at each other with their teeth and beating each other with their bodies, the little jacks can swim in and fertilize some eggs and uh, uh, they'll still die just like the, the others, but uh, they came back a little early and got, uh, got a chance to fertilize some eggs. So once they come out of the gravel, they'll uh, spend a different amount of time in streams. Some, some salmon will spend 
uh, up to a couple of years in the stream uh, and near shore before heading out. Others will actually, as soon as they come out of the gravel, they're, they're headed for the salt water. Um, making that transition from freshwater to salt water is a huge uh, physiological undertaking where you have to, you know, your body, the, you know, the body has to be able to process salts. So that's um, sort of the smolt phase is when they're adapting to those, those changes. And then once they're in the shoreline, you know, they use our shorelines as a, a pathway to go out to sea. And that's one of the reasons that uh, kind of the habitat on our shorelines is still super important. And, um, you know, particularly for Chinook salmon, king salmon, which are uh, one of our protected species um, because of their limited populations um, and depressed populations, they, um, they don't necessarily spawn naturally in Kitsap, um, Kitsap waters, but they use our shoreline um, use Kitsap shoreline uh, as a really important avenue uh, to go out to sea safely. So that's one thing uh, to really consider is that there's, there's the freshwater habitat that's important, there's the shoreline habitat that's important. Then they get out to sea and they may swim thousands and thousands of miles over um, anywhere from a year to four or five, six years or more in the case of trout and they will feed and grow and then uh, if they survive the process, they'll return and uh, make that transition again back to fresh water and start the process over. Um, in this diagram, you can actually see a few of the predators along the way. Um, juvenile salmon on the shoreline and in the stream are really great food for, um, for birds and other fish. Um, orcas, you know, many, many of us are familiar with kind of the relationship between orcas and Chinook. Orcas it are, um, there's the, the, the mammal eating orcas, but our um, endangered um, resident orcas, which feed primarily on salmon and Chinook are the biggest salmon. So they focus on those, but they will eat chum, which are the second biggest. And they certainly do eat other fish and particularly different times of year. But, um, but that's a really important link in, in the food web. All right, so um, I think my next thing is a uh, little poll question. This is one of the questions we get when we're out working with folks on the shoreline or on the, uh, or talking with folks and during salmon tours is, you know, how long do salmon live? And um, I thought this was kind of a fun way to talk about that. So um, these are all things that you can find in uh, waters around the Puget Sound and, and on the Kitsap Peninsula. The pink salmon is, it strays into Kitsap, but it's not one of our, our main salmon. Um, the Western pearl shell is pretty abundant in some of our creeks. Clear Creek has a lot of them. Uh, the signal crayfish is our main native crayfish and the darner dragonfly is one that you'll find in ponds and things. So of those, which do you think is the uh, shortest lived and A, B, C, or D? You pick the darner dragonfly and as an adult, you're right. You know, the, the adult uh, darners may be out for um, a couple months, but the larva, the little nymph you can see in the very corner can live um, five or six years in, uh, in, uh, in the ponds that they're in, preying on other things, um, but can definitely live more than two years, which is the life cycle of the pink salmon. So you look at that fish and for it to grow that big in that short of a time, it's, you know, it's running out to sea, it's eating a lot of, um, a lot of good forage fish and um, um, growing and getting strong, coming back to spawn. Um, so pink salmon is the right answer. Signal crayfish is, is a good uh, call too, uh, but they can actually live up to about 20 years. Um, and there are native crayfish, but they're really um, highly invasive in other parts of the world. Uh, because they're tough and long lived. And I see no one chose the Western Pearl Shell, which was a good call because it can live over a hundred years, uh, as much as 120 uh, in some estimates. So, uh, and I've got a little story to wrap up the presentation about the Western Pearl Shell. So good job y'all. And uh, go on to the next one. These are the species of salmon in our, um, in Kitsap County and in the Puget Sound. Chum and coho, if you see a big salmon in the stream, chances are it's a chum or a coho. Um, so put those up top. And chum is also called dogfish uh, sometimes. 
coho or the silvers, um, really popular um, fishing fish, um, especially uh, in our neck of the woods. And you notice all of these fish have the genus name of Oncorhynchus, and they are all of the same genus, but different species. But the two in the middle, the cutthroat and steelhead, behave very differently. So they don't necessarily die when they go out to sea and come back to spawn. So they're, um, they are still anadromous, but they don't, they don't die when they return. And then Chinook, and, which is our biggest, and pink salmon, they like um, bigger rivers. Um, pink salmon tend to like the lower parts of bigger rivers, um, and, but they will stray into our streams. Like I said, Chinook, uh, we, have, we have a couple places you can go see Chinook, um, like um, uh, where there's hatcheries uh, that, that support Chinook. So, um, but pink salmon, you're probably not gonna see in Kitsap. The same with sockeye. Uh, if you wanna see sockeye, your best chance might be to find the right time of year and go over to uh, the Ballard Locks or into Lake Washington. Issaquah has a salmon celebration as well. Uh, but sockeye like to spawn in lakes. So they're a, a different species. And each of these, um, particularly the cutthroat and steelhead have, um, they can just stay in the freshwater. Um, or they can go out to sea. And it's again, it's the same species, but it's just a different approach to the life cycle. The others can all do that, but it's not, not as common. Um, sockeye, um, maybe some of you are familiar with kokanee, that's a landlocked sockeye or one that doesn't go out to sea. So those are the species. I'll actually highlight each of them a little bit. Um, this is kind of um, a neat thing that's from the, the book. So if you do go to kitsapsalmontours.org, um, on the, the right side, there's a bunch of resources. And one of them is the Kitsap Salmon Field Guide. And it's got a lot of the things that I'm pulling out here. And you can, it's an online guide that you can flip through and actually see these same things. But here you can see the names. And I think one of the things that's significant to this is just reflecting how important these fish, all of these fish were to the Salish people and that they even had a name for the, the coho season. This is also nice because you can see the relative sizes of some of these fish. All right, so here are the two species that you're likely to see in Kitsap streams. And right now you're most likely gonna see the chum on the left. And that's what I've got to share with you a little later that, um, that Victoria and I will work together to uh, discuss and dissect and, um, and uh, answer questions as best we can. Um, one thing I like about these images is they, is they show lots of different parts of that life cycle and how they look during those different times. So you have the little, the little uh, alevin, which is down in under the gravel, has a little yolk sac came out of the egg and it uh, grows off of that yolk until it's big enough to come out of the gravel and become a fry. Um, fry in the case of chum, just barrel for the salt water. So they head straight to the salt water. Pinks do the same thing. Um, but, uh, and then they, you know, go through their changes, um, smolt into the sea run. Um, and if you notice the colors on the sea run and the spawning and even the body shape, they go through a major, major shift when they come back into the fresh water. But part of it's, you know, it reflects the, their needs in those different environments. So in the salt water, you know, they are prey, so they want to remain as invisible as possible. So if a predator is looking from below, it can be a little difficult to see them with the bright, um, the bright bottom of the fish if you're looking up. If you're a predator looking down from above, they have that dark background, you're looking down from above, it might be harder to see them against the dark depths of the ocean. Um, but once they come back, um, you know, there's maybe an element of camouflage, but really the biggest thing is to, uh, you know, be an attractive mate and, um, and get to um, have a, a place in the, um, in the spawning beds. So the males for chum often get these uh, really kind of pretty purple and dark um, vertical marks. Uh, that's probably where they get the calico name. The females tend to have a dark mark that goes down the middle. Um, not always, but and the other thing is just sort of the physical shapes in the body. The dog salmon get these massive teeth um, and a little, you know, a lot of the salmon tend to get a little bit of humping uh, behind their head. 
if you the pink salmon that you saw in the previous picture they are called also called humpies because they can become pretty ridiculous in their humps on the males um, but again those are some of the changes they go through um, and it's really impressive to see and of course it's not long that they're in those spawning colorations. They very quickly, um, the, all of their energy is going into uh, eggs and, and milt so they can uh, reproduce and their bodies are getting more and more susceptible to things like fungus and all sorts of stuff. The, the coho, um, again, it, they'll be in the streams, uh, not, as, not as many necessarily um, that you'll see uh, in particularly in Kitsap. Um, but again, very similar patterns. The, t the males tend to get uh, much more red, not as red as the sockeye, which are the classic bright red fish with the green head. Um, but, uh, but again, some very similar changes. And uh, uh, yeah, and so these are the two that you might be most likely to see. If you're really lucky, you might get to see a steelhead. That would be the other big fish, um, big salmon in the streams. And, you know, Age-wise, the previous two are sort of that, you know, three to five year age. The steelhead can actually live up to 11 years and come back multiple times. So it's, a, again, a very different, uh, different life cycle. And the, the cutthroats are also able to go out to sea and come back. They tend not to go as far, so they don't get as big typically. Um, the, the steelhead make just incredible runs out to sea. Um, but but yeah, the, and of course that makes the coho a really uh, important predator on, uh, on other salmonids and fish in both the near shore and in streams. So these are, um, these are uh, bringing in the uh, Chinook here. These are the two species, the Chinook and the steelhead that in Kitsap and the Puget Sound actually have protections because of their delete, um, depleted populations. Um, you know, the kings or the Chinook are, are definitely our, the biggest of our salmon and critically important to um, things like the orcas. Um, they're a wonderful fishery, uh, both fish both to eat and to fish for. Um, so they're uh, certainly important to us just um, for that aspect as well, but their populations are, are down and it's something that both on the land and the sea and the shoreline um, that we're working to uh, improve and protect habitat for, for both of these fish. Um, again, for, for Kitsap, the shoreline is super important for the, the Chinook and the streams as well are really important for the, for the steelhead. So the, I've kind of alluded to this food web a couple times, the marine food web, um, just highlighting how the salmon fit into this as um, you know, predators on all the small fish, um, which are important to lots and lots of different species. And you know, another reason to protect shoreline habitats is that's where these small fish spawn. So you know, it's kind of thinking about those connections all um, all through the different places salmon go and the different habitats and users of those of those places. So um, a lot of a lot of conservation work and thought and energy goes into protecting and uh, salmon and partly because of the complexity of their life cycle. In the freshwater um, freshwater uh, food web here is show, uh, shows here a lot of smaller things, so not as big and charismatic, but equally as complex. Uh, just the bugs in the streams alone, there's all sorts of different kinds. They have their own food web, um, but they're also really important for feeding the larger, the larger fish and animals. Um, I'll share just a few thoughts about some of these bugs uh, as we wrap up. And one of the things that I, uh, I did in my, actually I'll go back one slide, but uh, in my graduate work, because I, I came to the University of Washington to study oceanography um, and also stuck around to get a degree in fisheries, but I really didn't study or care that much about fish and things with backbones, which is a little sacrilegious, but I, what I really loved and was in, found interesting was the bugs and um, how you can collect a, these, some of the bugs from the community and look at, um, um, kind of the effects and the quality of the stream habitat. So this is just kind of reflects some of the diversity, but one thing I'll say is as big as this picture looks and the things look in the picture, everything here is like 
smaller than a pencil eraser, um, quite a bit smaller. So uh, it's a really diverse and complex uh, and interesting community, but it's also really tiny. So it involves a lot of time behind a microscope. Um, and this is somewhere you can go, you can go to uh, the website at the bottom, Puget Sound Benth Stream Benthos.org. Uh, and actually see all the samples that have been collected in our region. And the colors on this map indicate um, uh, water quality as interpreted from the community of, of stream invertebrates. So um, red obviously is poorer and uh, blue and green are, are healthier. And you can definitely see that, you know, urban development has impacts on, on water quality. Um, and there may, but there's even in urban environments, there may be things we can do to help restore streams. And certainly where we see um, the bug community, uh, an, an unhealthy bug community out in what should be um, less disturbed areas, that's places where we can often find uh, pretty quick ways to, to improve that situation. Um, so using the bugs for water quality. And these are the main three that people kind of think about. Um, and if any fly anglers out there, these are our common species um, that people work with. Uh, mayflies, stoneflies, and caddisflies. And stoneflies are big predators. So they're kind of like the lions of the stream bug world. The, the mayflies are really the, the gazelles and the deer. They're just, they're abundant and they're um, mostly just feeding off of um, bacteria and plants and things. So they're, uh, they're, and they're kind of soft and juicy. So they're a great food, whether you're a stonefly or a, a young salmon uh, or a, a trout hanging out in the stream. Um, and the caddisflies are kind of like, um, they're a lot like a moth, but they, uh, they live in streams and build some kind of a shelter typically that they, they live in. Um, but these are, you know, if you're interested in um, stream bugs, it can be kind of fun to explore these. And the diversity is really, really amazing and really cool. And anyone can just take a, preferably not this time of year, because you don't want to disturb the fish, but you can go out to a stream and uh, uh, just use a little aquarium net, dip some uh, things, uh, shuffle the rocks and put it in a little tray, see what you find and then, then release them. Um, it's, you know, every time you put your foot down in a creek, there's probably three to 600 of these critters under your foot. So it's pretty, pretty cool stuff. Here's a little quiz for you. Um, and actually I'll go back here real fast. You know, you notice you met, some of you may have been reading the identifying features here. You know, mayflies typically have three tails and have gills on the abdomen. Uh, and their, their thorax, you know, between the head and the abdomen is fused, which is um, something, uh, you know, that a lot of other insects like the, like the stoneflies, they're separate sections. So my question is, which of these critters is not a mayfly? Um, so you can look at things like tails and gills are kind of see, hard to see, they're fuzzy pictures, but um, see if you can guess. And A, B, C, or D. A brown stonefly down in the bottom left, C, is a, is a little stonefly. Um, you know, the two-tailed mayfly up at the top uh, left is actually one of, one of the challenges in identifying these things is that the, you know, uh, most mayflies have three tails, but some of the most common ones, unfortunately, have two tails sometimes. Or the, the mayflies are pretty delicate, so they break off. But, all right, very good. And let's wrap this up. I wanted to just share a couple of other slides about some of the bugs. You know, I shared this one. These are all the maggots. You know, the stream is full of fly larvae, and they're actually super important fish food, particularly the midges, which are the bright red one there. Um, that particular one has hemoglobin in its, in its blood, just like we do, to help deliver oxygen, thus the red color. And um, it allow also allows it to live in low oxygen environment low oxygen environments. Um, but, but yeah, so that's, these are still really important food sources and especially when they emerge out and then they uh, fly around for a while, come back to lay their eggs again. Um, they're, they're important to fish both as, as larvae because they're a soft food, easy to get, there's lots of them. Um, so 
you know, when juvenile salmon come out of the gravel, these, um, and again, particularly the midges are super important food for them. Some of these other things are crane flies and the rat-tailed maggot, which is kind of an awesome name. Um, but lots and lots of different, uh, different um, fly larvae that can be in streams, and really important. Um, I also wanted to highlight a few invasive species, or at least just to point out that they're around and that they can impact salmon habitat, both in freshwater and saltwater. The zebra mussel in the upper left um, is one that a lot of efforts going into preventing from um, arriving in our region. Um, the, uh, there's some snails and clams that actually take up uh, a lot of habitat and food. The, in the marine areas, we have the, green, the European green crab, which is a big issue right now that we're trying to address uh, because of its effects on marine habitats. And then lastly, I wanted to come back to uh, the Western pearl shell, which I mentioned earlier lives over a hundred years. Um, you can see the beautiful pearly shell. This particular one was from Clear Creek. Um, and there, there are quite a few of them there. Um, and, but they are hard to see, they're hard to spot, but they, you know, one of the interesting things about them is their life cycle. Without salmon or trout, they, they cannot reproduce. So you can have hundred year old mussels that haven't reproduced in 40, 50, 60, 80 years. So um, if the salmon are eliminated from a stream, these, you know, the, the effects go beyond the things that eat the salmon and, you know, even include things that like these um, mussels, which use salmon as part of their life cycle. And the way they do that, here you can see these sort of white things in this fuzzy image are called um, glochidia uh, conglutinates. So conglutinate is kind of the, the object, it's kind of a, like a big snot ball. They actually, it's, sort of meant, meant to look like rotten t rotten fish flesh or something and be tempting to other fish to eat. Um, but it's full of these little tiny baby mussels that will, when the fish eats it, the conglutinate erupts in their mouth and all these little clamping Pac-Man uh, mussels grab onto gills and other spaces they can find. And they will then get covered by the fish's gill um, as a, you know, the fish protects itself from them. And then they ride the fish for some period of time until they uh, grow a little larger and then emerge from their cyst on the fish's gills and settle down into the, into the stream bottom. So for a, you know, for a mussel, which is always gonna have the water pushing their larva downstream if they just spawned, this is a way for their, their for the mussel to distribute itself throughout a watershed. And there are some really amazing mussels from the Eastern US that have crazy lures and, um, and conglutinates to, if you ever wanna hop on YouTube or the internet and check out freshwater mussels and their uh, glochidia or conglutinates. So I think that is all I've got. And um, we'll have some time for questions and discussion. I wanna make sure there's plenty of time for Victoria. I don't know if, the, are there, questions that have come up um, that maybe could answer one? Um, there's one question so far um, by Marie. Are salmon the only type of fish that jump or catapult out of the water around Kitsap, excluding bass? That's a good question. Now, you know, if you see, and I, I will say Victoria is the fish person here. Her, her email is fish girl. And despite mine being Jaws, that I, again, it's more my initials than any relationship to fish. But um, the, you know, there are lots of fish that jump for a lot of reasons, either to, uh, you know, especially little ones will be fleeing predators and um, you'll see uh, bait balls of fish. You'll see little ones jumping around. Um, but I don't know. I'll, I'll uh, if Victoria is unmuted, she can maybe pipe in with some of the others that might do that. Mm, um, you know, nothing is, pardon the pun, springing to mind. Um, like you said, Jeff, the little guys tend to jump mostly to avoid predators. But, you know, if I say if I say no, somebody's going <laughs> to go on Google and go, wait. Um, but... I, I can't think of any spectacular examples off the top of my head. No. Prove me wrong. Go for it. 
somebody Google that during the next presentation. Totally. Uh, yeah, but that that is a good question because you know, especially yeah. if you if you see a big fish out in the in the salt water at this point, you know, this time of year especially, chances are it's salmon flopping around, which is pretty pretty amazing thing to see. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, thank you, Jeff, for your great presentation. Uh, thanks, Victoria, for helping to answer that question. So it's the perfect segue into introducing Victoria. Um, she is our next speaker today. And as Jeff said, she is the fish expert. And we are so happy to have her here. Victoria, the floor is yours. To um, follow on from Amy's um, introduction, I'm a retired fisheries biologist. I worked for the National Marine Fisheries Service, the Washington Department of Fisheries, Minnesota Department of Natural Resources, and I retired from the US Fish and Wildlife Service. I'm also a stream steward, a salmon docent, a beach naturalist, a rain garden mentor. Um, I volunteer with the Sea Discovery Center in Palsbo, the Green Crab Monitoring Program, which Jeff mentioned. So if this is something that interests you, there's just a ton of ways that you can be involved and I encourage you to do that. So today I'm gonna to talk about where salmon fit in the grand scheme of things, because according to FishBase, which is an online global database of fishes, there are more than 33,000 species of fish and as many as 250 new species may be described every year. So we're concerned with a relatively small group of fishes, the salmons, um, but it does have an outsized impact on the lives and culture of the people of the Salish Sea. So what we'll cover today, um, basic biology, general life history, basic ecology, and each of these three topics, general topics are very strongly interrelated. So I may at times talk about all of them at once. So um, let's start with some terms. Um, ichthyology is the branch of zoology that deals with fishes. And classification is arranging organisms into groups according to their similarities. Now, I totally ripped off this slide from Paul Dorn, but I figured, you know, why reinvent the wheel? Um, so life history, um, you'll remember that you saw Jeff's slide near the beginning of his presentation, is the series of changes undergone by an organism across its lifetime. Salmonid is the family name of all salmon and trout species. Habitat is the physical environment that influences and is used by a population or species. And anadromous, Pacific salmon go through a series of changes so that their bodies can migrate from freshwater to saltwater and back. So humans have studied fish for a long time, um, mostly because we like to eat them. A basic working knowledge of their life histories, habitat preferences, and general habits can be helpful when you're trying to bring home dinner and avoid being dinner. So why do we care about details like this? Well, first of all, it's important to recognize that our modern salmon come from very ancient roots. They've persisted because they were able to adapt to their continuously changing environment. Um, Meteors, tectonic shifts, climate changes, epic droughts, glaciation, and hopefully the perils of our modern age. But ultimately, if we really want to appreciate them and pass on their awesomeness to others, it helps to think about salmon in a way that takes in all that they are and kind of how they got that way. So let's start by finding salmon's place in the world. Classification groups, organisms by shared characteristics. So it shows how organisms, organisms are related to one another. And you can think of scientific classification as being like an address, continent, nation, region, city, street. Only the neighborhood refers to your branch on the evolutionary tree. This is a very generalized um, classification for salmonid fishes. The levels of classification are called taxa, and ichthyologists, the real ones, would parse it out a lot finer. But the point is that you can tell a lot about an organism by its classification because each taxon shares common characteristics. Osteichthys, for example, are the bony fishes, actinopterygii, 
that name will haunt you if you ever take up fisheries seriously, are fishes that have rays in their fins, teleosts are by far the largest and most diverse group of fishes. Um, so again, the point of this is to, is to um, show how fish are related to each other and what kinds of similarities they may share. From an ichthyologist perspective, there are, for practical purposes, three groups of fishes, but most of them fish fit into two groups based on the makeup of their skeletons. Although cartilaginous fishes may be referred to as primitive, I think a better term is ancient. In the evolutionary sense, they've been very successful. Um, while some of the more recently evolved, highly specialized forms like some tropical reef fishes really haven't yet stood the test of time. Let's take a quick step back for a minute and review the generalized family history of the vertebrates or animals with backbones. And without getting too technical, this slide shows the general cast of characters in their rough order of appearance kind of from upper left to lower right, um, and their evolutionary relationships. The Devonian period is known as the age of fishes, my personal favorite, because of the thousands of fish that developed during this time. The earliest fishes didn't have jaws or bones, which are the parts that fossilize well. So the very earliest fishes were, the very earliest fossils were of fish with bony plates or what we call shell skin. The next developments were jaws, gills, and paired fins. They still had shell skin, but mostly on their heads. Ancient sharks also developed during the Devonian as did the first fish with true bones. So everything's cruising along when mass extinction, typical, right? This is the one you've heard about, possibly a meteor impact or massive volcanic activity that led to reduced sunlight and a massive impact to the Earth's ecology. The Cretaceous extinction resulted in the loss of something like three quarters of all the species on Earth and marked the end of the Mesozoic era and the beginning of the Cenozoic era. era. There will not be a test on that. The climate cooled, non-avian dinosaurs became extinct, but a lot of fish and most mammals made it. Salmon survived and flourished in the newly cold waters of the boreal oceans. So how well do you know your geologic epochs, ages, and periods? I suck at it, so we'll mostly skip it, except to note a few sketchy facts. Salmon rarely appear in the fossil record, and this may be because they evolved in regions that were changing very rapidly, um, or because we just aren't looking in the right places. Eosalmo driftwood densis no test on that either, was first found in a bunch of pieces uh, amongst the driftwood, hence the name. Um, suffice it to say that we see Pacific salmon as dis first see Pacific salmon as distinct from Atlantic salmon by the early Miocene, about 15 to 20 million years ago. And that speciation occurred by the late Miocene or early Pliocene. And that will be the end of my talk on geologic eras. Okay, so let's focus a little more tightly on modern salmonids. The family consists of three lineages or subfamilies, the whitefish, the graylings, and the, the trouts, salmon, and chars. They're all predators. Um, they spawn in fresh water. Their appearance is usually described as relatively primitive or ancient because they have relatively small round scales and their pectoral fins are placed relatively far back on their bodies. They have an adipose fin, again, we'll get to that later, and their caudal fins or tail fins are weakly forked. As with their ancestors, their predators, their life history is characterized by rapid growth because of the richness of the marine environment, but a relatively short lifespan. Unlike most fishes in the Northern Hemisphere, they spawn in the fall and they lay relatively large eggs 
Fall spawning allows them to mature slowly in the gravel and emerge large and in charge in the spring when waters are warming and food is plentiful. Eggs also receive some parental care from the female who sticks around by her nest as long as she can, which helps to improve survival rates. So there are three themes, if you will, that are important keys to salmon behavior in ecology. As salmon, all salmon spawn in fresh water, if they migrate to the ocean and spend part of their lives there, this is the life history pattern called anadromy. The time spent in fresh and saltwater environments varies between species, as Jeff pointed out, and sometimes within species. Returning salmon famously tend to come back to the very stream where they respond. This is called homing. Salmon spawn only once. This is semoparity. In dying, they transfer many of the nutrients that they acquired in the ocean into the stream environment. So here you are hanging out in this nice quiet stream with all your thousands of brothers and sisters. Why in the world would you want to head downstream and live in the ocean? It might be a long way. The trip could be dangerous and who knows what you'll find when you get there. But of course, there's a trade-off in there. You're trading safety, which you would have in the stream for the chance to grow large in the ocean. As they move downstream, young salmon are preparing for profound changes. The most obvious is color. As they change from green-brown backs with par marks, that's the little fingery looking things. As they change from par marks um, into par <laughs> that provide camouflage in the stream to blue backs and silvery sides. They also become longer and slimmer. The timing of emigration is determined by internal physiology and sometimes by stream flows. They may often travel downstream at night, sometimes tail first. Um, in faster waters, they may um, move faster, but they tend to take their time according to where they are in their development phase. In many river systems, downstream migration has been complicated by the presence of dams and reservoirs, which alter patterns of water velocity and volumes of flow. Downstream migration can be dangerous too. As Jeff pointed out, there are predators all along the way, there are obstacles and stream temperatures can all affect survival rates, which can vary widely from year to year, run to run, place to place. When young salmon leave the river, they enter the area of fresh and saltwater mixing, which is called the estuary. Some species or runs spend relatively little time there, but others may hang out for a while, enjoying the rich variety of prey species and hiding places. Physical habitat characteristics are highly variable here. If you think about it in terms of levels vertically and horizontally during the day, estuaries, the water in the estuaries moves up and down with the tide and back and forth as well. So you have a lot of different kinds of habitats, even in one place. Chum fry enter the estuary from early February through late May with a peak around late March. As they grow, they move away from the edges and into more open water areas, eventually entering the coastal ocean. Estuaries also provide a more gradual transition from fresh to salt water, and young fish can sort of choose their preferred salinities by ordering themselves along the salinity gradient. During their um, first year, chum tend to stay pretty close to the mouth of the streams, but during their second year, they become what we call epipelagic, meaning upper open water, as they move into the open areas of the Gulf of Alaska and the Bering Sea. So this is really kind of a crude map, but it gives you a general idea of the relative pattern of ocean migration for salmon originating in British Columbia and the Salish Sea. Crudity is actually okay in this case though, because 
um, ocean migration and salmon marine ecology are still pretty poorly understood. So much of what determines growth and survival, such as food quality and availability, water temperatures, weather patterns, climate change, are both highly variable and hard to predict. They probably spend much or all of their time eating or looking for food. And of course, some of them die. If we knew more about when and how some mortality occurred, it would be really helpful, but we really just don't. There is some evidence that mortality is highest when salmon are still small um, and it decreases as they grow, which makes intuitive sense. Studies of stomach contents show that maturing and adult salmon are trophic generalists, which means they eat a little bit of everything. Most fish will do that. If it's right in front of their face and it's small enough to fit in their mouths, they will eat it, mostly. So chum rely pretty heavily though on soft bodied animals such as jellies and their digestive systems are adapted to get the most from these less nutritious sources. I think that's kind of cool. After their sojourns in the Northeastern Pacific, mature salmon are famous for finding their way back to the natal, their natal streams to spawn and die. Movement in the open ocean is not random though, and salmon seem to have a fairly good sense of where they are. And although there are a lot of theories and models out there, there's no real consensus as to how they actually navigate. They are able to orient to the Earth's magnetic field and they have a remarkable sense of smell, but it's also true that their ocean migration route and general swimming speed function and interact to bring them back around to their streams at about the right time to head back on up. Um, Arriving at the right time ensures that they have time to ascend the stream and still have enough energy left over to spawn. It's kind of an energy game. So that's how they tend to play it. They meet with a number of challenges, uh, changes in water velocity, temperature, salinity, and odors must all be dealt with. Olfactory imprinting, that is odors learned as young individuals, occurs at a very young age and is retained for life. Streams differ in their odor profile and salmon are actually able to sort that out. One theory is that salmon home on the uh, population specific odors of young salmon in their home streams and that uh, zeroing in on these pheromones provides the basis for homing. So there's, there's a thesis in there for someone. They may, there may also be a genetic component. We began with the assumption that all salmon go home, but straying, that is ending up in a different stream from the one where you were spawned, is an important part of salmon biology. A mixture of homing and straying spreads the risk that conditions in the home stream may be poor. Streams also repopulate spawning areas that have been impacted by natural disaster and provide additional genetic variation in home stocks. Okay, so once they get, uh, once they get into their home streams, then they're going to begin with their uh, spawning processes. And you'll recall from Jeff's talk that this is something that is of critical importance. They tend to sort, salmon tend to sort themselves out in time and space by having different run times. Jeff mentioned that some species tend to spawn relatively low in the stream while others spawn a little bit higher. Um, so the different species, uh, according to their size and their um, their natural tendencies will select nests or red sites um, where there is good water flow, um, adequate water depth and substrate size. And this helps to ensure this, this type of um, nest selection behavior helps to ensure that at some point when water levels in the stream changes, their nests won't be stranded and their uh, eggs won't be 
left high and dry. So um, now I'm going to switch gears, but before um, we get into the dissection, I'd like to give you a quick look at salmon anatomy and get in a little bit of physiology as well. Um, it's good to know something about anatomy because it provides clues as to how an organism makes its living and physiology is the study of mechanisms and interactions within an organism. So understanding how an organism works gives us an, some insight into what an organism needs to function at its best and if there are problems it gives us some clues as to how we can deal with that. Okay, so let's start with what we can see from the outside. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but um, some basic topography. This is um, anterior end, the posterior end with the caudal fin. Um, up is dorsal, down is ventral. Um, and these are some of the most uh, easily viewed features Let's see, uh, salmon have two sets of paired fins, um, the pectoral, which are here, and the pelvic, which are here, um, and four pairs, uh, four sets of unpaired fins, which are the dorsal, the adipose, the caudal, and the anal. Fins are used for stability and for propulsion. Uh, the adipose fin serves no known purpose unless you're a hatchery worker, then you cut it off. Um, salmon are epipelagic. That's a word I used, threw out very casually before, but again, that means that they live in the upper part, the upper layers of ocean water. Um, so they're adapted to extended swimming rather than to bursts of speed or tight maneuvering. Um, and you can see by the more general characteristics of their fins that this is what they do. The nostrils here or nares um, are as in humans olfactory, but they're not for breathing. They're not even connected to the throat. Salmon have an excellent sense of smell. The eye is large and complex um, as befits a, a predator. Um, the maxillary bone is sort of an upper lip that covers the teeth and helps to keep food in the mouth. Many fishes, including salmon, have teeth in places where humans don't, including their tongues, their throats, and other sort of odd locations. Salmon don't chew their food, so they need to have teeth that hold and position it for swallowing it in big chunks. The operculum or gill cover is here. Um, this protects the gills. The lateral line along here, if you've ever wondered what that was called, that is a lateral line, is a sensory organ that helps fish maintain balance, sort of like our inner ear, and to detect movement in the water. Next. So fish generally have three protective layers, skin, scales, and slime. The skin is the basic protective covering. There's also coloration. Salmon are silvery overall, but tend to be darker and or spotted on top and white on the bottom. Um, this provides them with camouflage in the open ocean. Scales are small hard plates that overlap to protect against predators as well as bumps and bruises. Fun fact, fish are born with a set number of scales that start out small and grow along with the animal throughout its life. Um, in fact, my first job out of college was aging fish from structures like scales. More on that later. Um, but if a fish loses a scale, it will grow a new one. Each species of fish has a different arrangement of scales and true experts can actually tell species apart by them. The top layer is slime. Slime can help fish to escape from predators, glide through the water, and protects against infections and pollutants. Another obvious feature are the eyes. Salmon are predators, so they need to have good vision underwater. As with humans, most of the eye is hidden. It's protected by the bones of the head. 
Although they don't have binocular vision like humans do, they can swivel their eyes independently. Think about how that would be. Um, anyway, <laughs> they do have a wide range of vision. They also lack eyelids, but then they're submerged in water all the time, so they don't really need them. So let's take a peek inside. Um, fish, including salmon, have a lot of the same internal organs um, that most other vertebrates do. Heart, liver, kidney, gonads. You can see these down here. Here's the heart, the liver, the ovary. This, is, this apparently is a female. Spleen, intestine. But they are, there are some important differences. The digestive system is relatively short and there are small finger-like projections called pyloric ceci that increase the surface area um, of the digestive tract and help them to better absorb their nutrients. Most of the digestion occurs in the stomach and the intestine is mainly for transport of waste. Many fishes, including salmon, have a gas bladder which you really don't see in this diagram, but it is in this region. Um, this helps them to maintain their position, their buoyancy in the water. Um, many fish have two kinds of kidney tissues, the kidney here, the large kidney, um, uh, which has a function similar to adrenal, adrenal glands, and then up here, the head kidney, which produces blood. Um, let's see. I think that's about it. Um, for the, you won't, one important um, uh, thing you'll notice here is that fish have gills. That seems pretty obvious. Um, this is how the, they extract uh, oxygen from the water. So, um, salmon belong to the class osteichthys or bony fishes. Their skeletons are made up of true bone rather than cartilage like sharks and rays. The skeleton flexes from side to side to create thrust in swimming, but it's less flexible up and down. Like in humans, the ribs, the ribs give the fish its rounded shape and protect the internal organs. So everybody needs oxygen, right? Air is about 21% oxygen and our lungs do a good job of extracting what we need. Water contains varying amounts of dissolved oxygen. In general, moving water contains more oxygen than still water and cold water contains more oxygen than warm water. Although oxygen may account for about 34% of the dissolved gases in water, in seawater, that still amounts to only about 0.6%, which is a lot less than air. So fish gills need to be particularly efficient at extracting that oxygen, and they are. And the way that they do this is they have this countercurrent system where um, the water flows through, the blood flows around, and so in this way, they're able to sort of get a double boost um, as the oxygen moves, as, as the blood moves through the gills. Um, while the fish are in the water, the, um, the gill filaments are supported by the water. But if you take a fish out of water, then those gill filaments will collapse. The fish will not be able to extract water from air and the fish will eventually die. Okay, so that is what I have. Um, and um, I can take some questions if there are any. All right, Victoria, there is a question that you could probably answer. Uh, this is from Melissa. One of Jeff's graphics suggested that delays to downstream migration cause mortality in salmon smolts. What are some of the causes of delays to downstream migration? Okay, that's a really great question. Um, most of the delays are caused by um, 
dams uh, and reservoirs. Um, there are two basic kinds of dams. There are the, the big structures that we think of like Grand Coulee that create a reservoir. And then there are smaller kinds of dams and generally smaller kinds of dams that are called run of the river. But even those dams will tend to backwater up. And anytime you have um, an obstacle like that, that backs the water up, you're going to have um, problems for salmon, um, particularly for juveniles, because one of the things that they do, one of the reasons they're able to navigate the streams is that movement of water is critically important. So um, if you have an area of, of slack water or warmer water, you're also going to have um, problems with less oxygen, um, <clears throat> excuse me, in the water. So um, you have a little bit less support for movement. Um, it's kind of a kind of a double whammy. Although sometimes, <clears throat> if you have um, natural droughts or things like that, you can also have times when um, those similar sorts of conditions may occur naturally. Thank you. There's one more question, and then we'll move on to the dissection. Mm -hmm. uh, this one's from Marie. What happens to salmon if they can't reach their home stream? <clears throat> Do different salmon generations make up for the loss? Um, yeah, if a great example would be um, the Mount St. Helens eruption in 1980. It was huge and um, some streams like the, the entire Toodle River for most of its length was impaired. So the fish that were trying to get up the Toodle obviously weren't able to, but over time, fish runs have been restored in that stream. And so the mechanism for that is straying. Um, as I mentioned, a certain amount of straying is natural. Um, so the fish that would have been coming back um, expecting to swim up the Toodle would, um, at, at some rate they would find, some rate that I don't know, would find their way up into other streams, alternative um, pathways, um, and frankly, some would just die. But um, particularly in our area where we have um, so, uh, so much volcanic activity, that's something that is it's kind of built in um, to um, salmon's genetic history and is actually fairly important. Wonderful. Thank you, Victoria, for such a great presentation. All right, let's move on to the dissection. Well, let's, um, we can take a look at these fish. You know, we've got about 10 minutes left here and um, the flies and uh, yellow jackets are getting very excited. Um, <laughs> also, a Amy and um, Victoria, you can just let me know if there's any problems with video or volume, but I, I also left a tape measure out here just to give you an idea, you know, these, uh, these are all chum. Uh, we go from a, a large male and a large female to a smaller male and then a, um, you know, um, a jack that, you know, probably came in quite a bit earlier. So we probably have a, maybe a four-year-old fish and, a, uh, and then, you know, maybe three and then just a younger one. Um, but uh, Anyway, the, I also want to say that these were provided by uh, the Suquamish tribe, uh, the Grover's Creek Hatchery. They grabbed them for Amy yesterday and, uh, you know, limited fish numbers coming back so far for them. And uh, it was a real, very generous for them to provide these for us to uh, take a look at and, and appreciate. Um, one thing, I, hopefully you can see this okay in your, um, in your video, but just wanted to show you some of the markings, these really striking sort of pink markings on the male. You know, this female, at least I hope she's a female, we'll find out when we cut her open. You know, mm -hmm. looking at the, the nose, she doesn't have nearly the, the sort of nose modifications of the male. But often the female chum will have a, a much darker line, but not always uh, down, down the mid, kind of along the lateral, lateral line that Victoria described. Um, this one has some dark marks. And um, yeah, so I actually opened this mail up already, and we can take a look inside it. Um, I can also point out, you know, some of those other features that um, actually this. Notice the fins clipped here. Mm -hmm. One... Hmm. 
I may even have my species wrong on this one. Anyway, we'll have to come back to that one. But <laughs> that's one they said was a jack that came in. Um, but here we can look at the adipose on this, this guy. So if you see this really big, floppy, fleshy fin on the back, well, I say really big, but it's, it's really not that. It's large on this one because he's a uh, large fish, but, um, but that's the adipose fin that Victoria said gets, gets clipped off um, in, the, in the hatcheries as a way to tell the difference. Um, but yeah, this, you know, this male is about 30 inches long. So these are, these are very big fish. And, you know, you can imagine if you're a, a um, if you're an orca looking for a, a meal, chasing down some, something like this is going to give you more benefit than chasing down, um, a little jack or something. Um, sometimes when these come in fresh, you can actually see, um, see even little, uh, marine things that are still on them, like the little copepod parasites called fish lice. Um, you know, when I said male, you can look at the nose on this guy. So see the, the large, large teeth and the hooked nose, that's more typical of the males than the females. If you go to Chico, the mouth of Chico Creek, kind of in the estuary at low tide, uh, look around in the, the kind of vegetation stuff. Uh, in the winter, sometimes you can find jaw bones of all the salmon that have, uh, you know, spawned there in the in the late fall, and kind of washed down. And it's really interesting to see those uh, kind of jaw bones lying around. Uh, gives you an indication of just the sheer number of fish. And then here, this female, again, you can take a closer look at her nose. Not nearly as significant of modification. Um, and Victoria, I'll also let you kind of point out some of the, the stuff. I'll open up this fish and we can take a look inside. Um, do you want to kind of narrate some of that? And I'll try to kind of point things out. All right. Well, we'll, we'll see how we do. See how that works. This is, this is a new, <laughs> new attempt. Usually we have a chance to go through a whole process with folks in a classroom and it's, it's really kind of interesting and, and fun, uh, but we're, we're making the best of it here. And it's, uh, Again, really appreciate the Suquamish providing these for us. Uh, I will show the the gills here. I, I, you know, Victoria was talking about the teeth that are kind mm -hmm. of everywhere. I don't know if you can see teeth at my finger there, but um. yeah, but they are in there. Um, the gills, the gill arches have filaments on one side, and then they have little teethy sorts of things on the other side. They're called gill rakers, and that's another place um, where they're able to snare food. That's a that's a great shot. Yeah, you can see those um, those nice red um, engorged with blood type gill filaments on the one side, and then the gill rakers on the other. Um, and just just um, as a, a a point of interest, if you will, the the modified jaws, um, particularly on the male, are called kype, K Y P E. Kype. You know, fish people, we always have to call things something. We can't leave well enough alone. <laughs> All right, I am going to see. I tried to get a little bit ahead of opening this fish. Mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't be fumbling with it the entire time, but uh, <laughs> but I will try to take off a piece of the the side here so we can look in. Mm -hmm. Give me a moment, and it, folks can feel free to kind of ask questions. This is meant to be a little more interactive and uh, point things out, ask questions about what they're seeing. Right. So you can you can see that um, underneath the flap of flesh that Jeff is removing that there's a large fleshy looking structure. What do you suppose that is, you guys? Since they're in spawning condition at this point, that is that is the um, the male testis, and it is full of milt or sperm. Um, in the stream, what you'll have um, when they're actually in, in the throes of mating and spawning courtship, if you will, is that the males and females, the female will begin by digging the nest with her tail. She'll kind of clear a spot in the gravel. She'll uh, remove some of the um, 
some of the uh, silt and twigs and stuff like that. Um, and uh, you'll end up with a clean hollow. She'll hover over that. The males will come in, they'll come alongside. And um, as, the, um, as the female re releases her eggs, the male will fertilize those sperm at the same time. And I noticed somebody, you know, I put the question in the chat earlier. Um, so we are bony fishes, I believe, if I remember right. And, um, you know, I think that's one of the interesting things to, to think about as we look at this. You know, we are not that different from these critters. So um, some of the parts that we have to look at here, you know, if you can think about your own internal organs, you know, what do you have that looks pretty similar to this? You might say a liver. Indeed. And we can take this liver out, set it aside. There's something that they have that's a little different from us. It's a very large liver, healthy liver with a green. That's a green bile duct there. Absolutely. Good looking. Looks, again, some f familiar things. Um, try to get to the heart here. A couple other things that you can see while I'm in here. This is a feature that we don't have necessarily. Victoria, I don't know if you want to say anything sure. about it. Yeah, now right now Jeff's pawing around in the digestive system, which if you'll remember I said is relatively short. You've got a short esophagus into the stomach where most of the digestion occurs. Um, and those finger-like or uh, spaghetti-like structures are called pyloric ceci. They, again, they function to increase the volume of the digestive tract and help with nutrient absorption. And that's something we don't have. So. And these fish have probably not been eating. They're focused on, on getting into the, getting into the stream and, uh, and reproducing. There's this little feature too. Goes at the end of it. Mm -hmm. Anybody know what that is? Anybody have any thoughts? That's the spleen. <laughs> I feel like I hear mostly about the spleen, like from cartoons or something. It's, it's we'll just sort of make fun of. Um, right. Lost my spleen. You lost my spleen. Yeah. So it uh, functions in um, uh, production of blood cells, just like in people. And these testes are a significant portion of the critter. They are. There's also a heart, heart right in here, which notice, oh, geez, noticing that we're running low on time, I figure maybe I'll open up the female, we'll look at the eggs and then kind of call that good and folks can ask some questions um, while we do that. The other thing that I did want to show though, um, I started to kind of open up the top of the head on this one. You get to the cartilage here, you can actually see the brain underneath the cartilage. I don't know if you can through here, but um, you can see the brain. If we were to actually dig a little deeper, you can find these hard bony bits in there that it, uh, Victoria was talking about aging fish. Those are the otoliths and those can be sliced and rings can be counted to age the fish. Uh, yeah, Jeff, Jeff also mentioned that um, these fish probably hadn't been eating since they enter fresh water. That's partly due to um, the physiological changes that they, um, they go through um, when they re-enter fresh water. But also, if you look at those modified jaws, those kipe, they do not um, facilitate um, feeding. It would be really tough to eat that way. But yeah, and mostly I think the, the main thing to see is the female. We can try to dig into the, uh, into the uh, see if we can get some otoliths as well. But if you can see inside this female is an enormous number of large eggs. One of the things that I, um, that I really uh, 
found interesting at the mouth of Chico once was uh, watching uh, mergansers, a, a diving duck, uh, fishing for these eggs as they were getting washed out by the strong flow from a storm. Um, and, uh, you know, the fact that these, the membrane of this broke open so easily, you know, these are, this female is pretty much ready to go. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you have more to, that you'd like to say these as well. Yeah, maybe. Um, you'll, you'll notice that, um, that the eggs are pretty large. Um, and that's one of the reasons that um, anatomy developed um, in these species because they um, are able to take advantage of that rich marine environment. Um, and then these uh, large eggs have a better chance of, um, of survival. So um, there are uh, probably somewhere between 2,500 and five to 6,000 eggs produced per female, the larger the female, the more, the greater number of eggs. Um, of those, you'll be lucky to get mm, between 40 and 60% that will actually hatch out. Um, so even with having the larger eggs, um, survival, survival can be iffy. Also, I think it's really interesting that um, uh, once the eggs hit the water, immediately they begin to, when, when they're spawned out, that is um, over the red, almost immediately they begin to suck up water. This is called water hardening. And this is why you have males that are right there and ready to fertilize those eggs because once water hardening is complete, um, the sperms are actually unable to penetrate. Um, the egg and fertilize it. So um, I, that does a couple of things, but it, it ensures that, generally ensures that only one sperm at a time is able to get in and fertilize. And it also helps the egg to protect itself. So Jeff is now peeling back a few layers um, of the head. Um, fish are not brainy creatures. I've seen a lot of fish brains in my day, and most of them are only about the size of the end of your little finger at best, um, even in fairly large species. Um, but uh, you'll notice that there's a lot of cartilaginous material that has to be cut away to get in there. So it's it's sort of analogous to your skull. It's a good protective system for, for the brain, for um, all these areas in the body that are very highly innervated. They have a lot of nerve endings, a lot of um, really important sensory pathways to protect. Um, I have a question for you all by Julianne. Is the female considered to suffer pre- spawn mortality uh -huh. and were these fish caught by the tribe or found dead great question yeah. so amy might be able to answer the the caught how they were uh, received question yeah they were they were caught live when i went there they caught them um in the pond that they have and then uh, bopped them on the head and sent them my way. Right. And pre-spawn mortality. So these were, these were not, you know, the, and in one of the later classes, I, next week, Amy, going to learn more about pre-spawn mortality, probably. Um, uh, next week's. Next week's. Yeah. And, you know, that's, these did die before spawning. Um, that's why we're able to actually see the, the milt and the row or the sperm and the eggs. But, um, you know, that was, it, you know, the, the pre-spawn mortality that's not kind of a direct um, harvest like this is where you have things like chemicals in the water that are causing the fish to die before they're able to spawn. So you see what looks like a nice healthy fish that just was unable to swim and function. And, um, uh, died before getting to its spawning beds. So um, that's a major stormwater issue for coho in the area. 
and um, something that a lot of work is going into to try to, to prevent. Um, Cause that's, you know, to have the fish make it all that way and then just um, not be able to spawn because of, you know, bad water chemistry is, is really you know, something we want to uh, cha change if we can. Right. It's, yeah, I, I agree. Um, and there are also other factors that might um, uh, be fairly, oh, there it looks like you got one. Um, <laughs> Trying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, particularly in, in our, um, our, our modern, modern systems where so many streams are crossed by um, by highways. Um, there are many streams that are built over um, with buildings, houses, they're hemmed in. Um, and these can all cause problems with um, upstream movement, downstream movement. So um, it's definitely possible that um, some of these streams have fish passage issues um, that will also be related to um, uh, pre-spawning mortality, females and males. So the otoliths that, um, that Jeff is looking for, um, there are six of them. They're paired on each side. You have three on each side. Um, they're analogous to our ear bones um, and they function in, in roughly the same way to, um, to help with balance and orientation in the water. They um, are found in these um, gooey little um, sacks um, that have hairs inside so that as the fish tilts in the water, the hairs move just like, just like in our system. So um, there's this really kind of cool book out there. Um, I've been sort of looking at some of the, some of the chat and um, this book is called your inner fish. It's written by a guy, guy named Neil Shubin, who is um, a paleobiologist. He's been like looking for the missing link of fishes and um, actually found it. It's called Tiktaalik, um, but it's a really cool fish book. It's a cool story about how um, vertebrates are linked together by their biology and their physiology. So if it's something, and, and it's written on a very accessible level, you don't have to be a scientist to enjoy it. Um, like normal people have told me, people who are not fish heads have told me they really like the book. So again, that's your inner fish. If it's something you um, are interested in reading up on. And Victoria, I believe I have the brain here on my thumb, but I am digging around. You know, the so these otoliths I'm looking for, what, like rice grain kind of size? They are small. Yeah, so I, I'm sort of feeling around for a little hard tick or something against my tweezers. I haven't found it. So, which is one of the, I don't know, it's one of the, kind of one of the fun things that we do when we do this in a classroom is it's almost a challenge to the, teams oh that might be one a challenge to the teams who are doing this you know who can find nope uh who can find an otolith uh and share it with the group and i might strike out here but um it's worth a try and you oh, know wait. <laughs> for all of the skills that these things have in their sense of smell their their vision that um the Victoria was talking about the paths they take, you know, this is that little brain that's operating all that. It's pretty remarkable. Yeah, not, not much of a... <laughs> <laughs> not the brainiest creatures. No. Well, I might stop the digging there just so we can uh, get on with other questions if anyone has them or get on with the day if that's the, the next step. Um, uh there is one more question. Um, this is from Melissa. So I gather that the timing of salmon runs in Kitsap streams is dependent on fall rains. So are sometimes a few weeks earlier and sometimes later? Oh, great question. And, you know, we actually heard that the, um, that the salmon were in the creeks like last week. Um, so uh, down in Chico, um, which is pretty early. Halloween is a great measure um, that 
a fisheries biologist told me kind of when I first uh, came to Sea Grant that, you know, they're going to be somewhere around Halloween. Um, you know, they may be a little earlier, they may be a little later, um, but you're absolutely right. It depends on when the water is, um, uh, you know, when the rains come, when the water is a, a good level for them, um, and, uh, you know, when they're able to access. Right. I'm trying to dig out a nodolith. I don't think I was successful. <laughs> it, it, it would honestly look about like, um, about like any other tiny little piece of, you know, like this little piece of cartilage here I thought was one. Um, it just really won't be much more than that. Um, I'll, I'll keep digging <laughs> for a few yeah, minutes. Say, say Jeff, someone suggested maybe you can show it next week. Uh, oh, yeah. that's a good idea. Yeah, we yeah. I've yeah, they, they're kind of, they're, they're sort of a broad, flat structure, a little bit frisbee shaped sort of, um, and they, the, Jeff mentioned that you can use them for aging, um, for determining aging, and, and um, it works just basically just like tree rings. Um, there are um, daily growth increments that are recorded. Um, there are annual growth increments as well. And if you spend enough time training at it, and you probably don't want to do that, but trust me, it's possible to, um, to look at those um, daily and annual growth increments and learn a lot about where that fish has been. All right. My, my last attempt here is, continues to be unsuccessful. I didn't want to hack these fish apart until we get here, but... Uh... It does leave that possibility open that I won't find something I'm looking for. Uh, Do all jacks have a black mouth or just the Chinooks? Oh, good question. Um, yeah, for the most part, um, Chinook jacks will show those black gums. Um, it's not universal. Not all of them have black gums, but as far as I know, um, no other species exhibits the black gums, just the Chinooks. And then one more question. What species is the jack salmon? Ah. King? <laughs> well, we... Victoria? <sighs> yeah, let, let's, let's look at the mouth. Does that help? Not, not as much you as... Know, the, chum, the chum have, you know, dark as yeah. well. Um, you know the. Hmm. You know. It doesn't. So it if, looks. Let Let me uh, see the which, tail spots. Yeah, I mean, if it were a Chinook, it looks more like a coho. It, to me, it looks more like a coho. You, it's really those the the spots on the back are really sparse, and um, just the upper lobe of the tail seems to be spotted. I'd kind of go with coho. But it's yeah, and that would help explain why you know why the uh, the, f the fin's been clipped. But mm -hmm. right, right. But, you know that is one of the tricks, certainly for uh, new anglers. You know, you want you need to be able to kind of practice those IDs. Um, and uh, you know, for me, I'm I'm not a, a big fisherman, um, and mostly I see them in the stream. So. Um, you know, for me, I, I look at these spawning patterns and when I see something like this, I'm like, huh, well, I don't exactly know, but, but yeah. Yep. All right. Well, thank you, Victoria, Jeff and Bob for staying on past the time to answer questions. And uh, thank you all our wonderful participants today for taking time out of your day to be here.